And you're going to get them home and they'll teach you some more about the Lord, right? Yeah. It's not just a one day Sunday, learn about it, and then they're out in the world at school and on TV and seeing all this stuff. And then, you know, they don't hear anything else about the Lord. And it's not going to make it, it's not going to make them what they need to be in the Lord. So we're going to teach them at home how to do it, right? Man, praise Amen. God, because we're wonderful parents and we love our children. We are going to be today in the book of Mark. The fifth chapter. Hallelujah. What a wonderful Lord's Day this is. A wonderful day to be alive. To be alive in the Lord. Hallelujah. I can't think of a better place to be right now. I really couldn't. I couldn't think of a better place to be. This is where I want to be. This is where the Lord told me to come. Praise God. I'm able to be obedient to Him and to your word today as well. Hallelujah. I'm not always there, 100%. Pray for your pastor. But when it comes to coming in the church house on Sunday, I can't wait. It's my favorite time of the week. Hallelujah. And then my family's here too. And my children here, and my hubby here. Hopefully they're learning something. Okay. You okay. there, Mark, the fifth chapter. You know, the last couple of weeks we were talking on... Um, we were talking about the power of contentment. You know how to, you know that contentment isn't it isn't a, a product of what's going on around you, right? It's it's it really it should be based on what's going on around you. It, it should be based on you know the fact that you have a relationship with with the mighty God, with Christ. Amen. That you know that He is your joy, He is your peace. That you know Him, you have a relationship with Him. And then you just, you know, that alone is enough to make you just uh, need to want to jump around for joy. You know, mm-hmm. things happen and life happens, but we remain in that joy. We remain content no matter what. And then when we, you know, when we're in our darkest time, we talked about how, how Paul was in, uh, was in prison, him and Silas, at, at the midnight hour when it was so dark and so bleak and they had been whipped and they had been mistreated and they were tied, put in chains. You know, for, for persecuted for preaching the gospel of Christ, and in that darkest hour, how they just lift up their their voices and, and praise and sing songs to the Lord, Hallelujah! And then, as a result of that, God came through and He supernaturally caused an earthquake, an earthquake that caused them to be free from their chains and allowed them then to minister. And, and to be a witnesses for the other prisoners and bring them to salvation and the guard and, and you know and I, I you know my, my point in all that was you know when when you are in your darkest moment just give him the praise anyway hallelujah because when you do something supernatural will happen something God will intervene in that situation and he'll cause something that happened that you couldn't have done on your own praise God he'll cause something to happen that would not have happened if you had taken the the, uh, the different attitude uh, of, of, of being upset about it and being gloomy and, and hopeless. People, God, you have hope. Amen. You have Amen. hope. I don't care what's Amen. going on in your life. You have hope. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And he wants you to have a good God. God is not withholding good things from you. You know, God's not withholding things to, to, to try to torment you or teach you or punish you. Don't ever believe that. Amen. You know why? You know why I know that? Because my Christ, my Savior, received the punishment that I should have gotten on the cross. Amen. And it was a finished work, people. He did it perfectly. He did it wonderfully. He did it completely. Jesus did not do anything halfway. He did it all completely for you and for me, but we couldn't do for ourselves. Praise God. So, you know, God is not out to punish you, people. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you. He's your, he's your Abba Father. He's your Father. Yes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he just adores you. And you know, and maybe something's not going on right in your life. You know what? Just just lean on him and trust him and, and get happy. Hallelujah. Amen. Get happy. Praise God. Okay? So anyway, that was all for free. Uh, we're in Mark, the fifth chapter, and in the tw- let's start in the 21st verse. Okay, so last couple of weeks we talked about the power of gratitude, or I'm sorry, the, the power of, that's another one we got to get into, we've got to tap into that one, but the power of contentment. So this week and maybe next week we'll take it on uh, again as a, we're going to talk about the power of belief. We're going to talk about the power of belief. So let's just go ahead and read starting in the 21st verse. It says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, 
a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, and then it starts talking about the woman with the issue of blood. We know her very well. Hallelujah. We know her very well. We talk, we've talked about her many times in the church. Um, and uh, and so let's just go ahead and skip over to the chapter. You know, the woman with the issue of blood comes on the scene. She touches the hem of his garment. She gets healed of an infirmity of bleeding that she had for 12 years. Jesus then acknowledges her, tells her that it was her faith that saved her. And then uh, we go, and Jairus, and all, during all this time, that this is happening, he there stands Jairus. His little daughter is home, close to death, and there he stands, waiting for this woman to, to, to you know, for, for Jesus to finish ministering to, to this woman. And so, you know what, I, I can only imagine what's going on in his head, why this is all happening. He's probably like, okay, I know, this is my daughter. Okay, Jesus, my daughter. Okay, so let's continue on the 35th verse. While he was still speaking, this is Jesus, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl rose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the message. We thank you, Father God, that your word is filled with truth, full of truth. Father God, full of food for us to eat, Father God. We thank you, and as we eat and partake of it today, we pray that it would work to change our lives, Father God, to give us the things that we need to have, Father God, and to give us more trust, more faith, and more belief in you. We thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, we know these stories real well because we've, got, we've read them over and over. And the wonderful thing about, the wonderful thing about the Word of God that there's so much to read, even from, from one event or one story. I and mean, you can just preach on one story for months and months because there's so much to gain out of it. You know, we should never say the, 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 you know, or think that the Bible is boring. The Bible's not boring. I mean, the Bible has so much. It has, it has everything that you ever want in a movie. You know, it's got adventure and it's got suspense. And, and it even has, you know, some of the more that some of y'all like to see in movies. I don't know why. But it's all in the Bible. Love stories and, and you know, stories of betrayal. You know, we uh, how many of y'all used to watch soap operas? I did. You know, all <laughs> There is no soap opera that that is you know that is more filled and packed up full of the things that we wanted to see in that soap opera than in the Bible. Hallelujah! It's a wonderful work, but you know what? It's wonderful because then we learn from it and we can take what we read and apply it to our lives, and we can know that the people that things that they went through, you know what? They're just like us. You know, these are not fictional characters like in a soap opera. These are real people that lived and went through things, the same things that you and I. Through, right, so um, so we can when we read the Bible, we can get it for us to take from it and, and let it change our lives, right? Praise God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so today you know I want to talk about again the power of belief, and so why is it so important that we uh, our belief, what we believe in? Why is it so important to believe and to believe in something good? Um, you know, our beliefs, in my opinion, and I and I read up a, a, a lot of books on psychology and. and Science and you know, our beliefs can either uh, make us or they can break us, so to speak. Okay, our beliefs are extreme. What we believe about anything in life is extremely, extremely important. What our beliefs dictate actually 
They're so powerful. Our beliefs are so powerful that they dictate our very lives. Mm-hmm. You know what? I, you, I can look in your life right now and tell you what you believe. I, I can. I can tell you. You know, I can look at your finances. I'm like, you know, you know, I know what you believe in about your finances. Okay, I can look at, you know, what, what kind of life are you living? I, you know, and I can tell what, what your thoughts and what your beliefs are. Okay? Um, so beliefs are extremely important in the world. Webster's definition is uh, of belief is a state or habit of mind in which trust or confidence is placed in some person or thing. Okay, and we know who our trust and confidence is placed in, right? We are correct. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. And so in the Bible, you know, I, again, I read a lot of books on, on the mind and psychology, and they're not saying anything that the Bible isn't saying. I mean, we've gotten, the Lord said it first, hallelujah. You know, he said things that, we read things in the Bible, like in Mark 9, 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Christ told us himself that believing is so powerful. He says, if you believe, then you can bring about in your life that very thing that you're believing for is possible for God. Mm-hmm. So the question is, what are you believing? What are you believing? What are you believing about your life? What are you believing about your finances? What are you believing about your relationships, about your job, about your health, about your future, about the future of your children? So important people of God that we believe in what God wants us to believe. You know, God is a is a wonderful God that, that wants to provide and gives us a good life. So we got to believe that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's time to believe him. Say, Pastor, Pastor. it's time. Yeah. And I yeah. am going to believe him. Hallelujah. 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 Okay? And so even we are familiar with the, with the scripture, Mark 11, 23, 24. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes yeah. that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you might have them. Well, maybe you have them. No, my Bible says you will have them. People of God, you got to start believing that what God says belongs to you will come to pass. But you gotta believe it. That's what the word just said. You gotta believe it, okay? Even the most powerful scripture in the Bible, the, the, one of the best known scriptures, we all know, let's recite it. John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And even that scripture, listen, our very, our very destiny, our eternal destiny is based on what we're believing. Our eternal destiny. If we're believing in him that he died for us, hallelujah, at the cross of Calvary, then our destiny is heaven. And for those who don't believe because they don't believe, their destiny is another place that we don't like around here, okay? So how powerful is that? You're very future. You're outside of this world, you're outside of this life that you're living, your very future is going to be based on what you believe, right? What you believe during this life. Hallelujah. Okay? And we know that there are many other instances in the Bible where belief brought miracles, right? We read, um, remember the centurion who the servant was sick, you know, the Bible, the Lord, the Lord says, you know, I've not seen greater faith, you know, uh, he was believing the woman with the issue of blood that was that we just talked about, um, the, the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter had, had, she wasn't even Jewish, but her daughter had an evil spirit. She knew who to go to. She knew what she believed in. She knew that she went to Jesus and asked him that he would do it. That was her belief. And guess what? He did it. He did it. Okay? What are you believing? What are you believing? Okay? Um, and then um, I want to read this Matthew 9, 27, 30, just to bring home again the point that in the Bible, when things happen, when miracles happen, it was because somebody believed. Mm-hmm. Matthew, I'll read it, you don't have to go there. Matthew 9, 27 and 30. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. 
And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. He asked them, such a, It's such a simple question. Do you believe? It's so powerful. So powerful. I'm here to ask y'all people today, do you believe? Hallelujah. What are your beliefs? Okay, and so our scripture today, here is Jairus, you know, a loving father coming to the master because his little girl was dying. And Jesus tells him two powerful words. Only believe. Even after they told the, the man, leave the master alone, your daughter's dead, there's nothing he can do. And what does Jesus say to him? Only believe. Hallelujah. Oh, believe. Okay? And I want to uh, share with you today, Jesus gave him this only, these two powerful words. But let's look at what Jesus was really saying to Jairus. Okay? Number one, Jesus was telling him, only believe. In other words, don't let unbelief seep in, Jairus. Don't let unbelief seep in. You know? Hallelujah. Right? I didn't listen. I'm convinced, again, that Jesus could only do miracles if the person, somebody believed. He needed somebody to believe. Hallelujah. People, God, God needs y'all to believe. Okay? Um, and we know in the Old Testament, in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, says that the Israelites, they limited God because of their unbelief. In other words, God was so ready to do wonderful miracles for these people. He loved them. He brought them out of bondage, out of Egypt. He fed them in the desert. He did wonderful things, and he wanted to do so much more for them, but he was limited. God, the only way people, God, you want to know how you limit God? Just don't believe him. Just don't believe him. You limit him. You plug up that pipe line to heaven. He still loves you. He still will protect you. He still has a good future for you. And he's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to believe. Praise God. In Matthew 13, it says, Now he did, speaking of Jesus, now he did do not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He went into his hometown, right? You know, people were. Uh, you know, they were talking about his miracles and all the wonderful things that he had done and, and, and what a great teacher and, and what a great um, uh, uh, miracle worker he was. And uh, and the people started saying, well, how can that be? Don't we know him? He grew up here. We know his father was a carpenter. We know his sister. We know his mom, his brother. We hang out with him. That can't be. And so Jesus, what did he say? He left them. He says, it says you could do nothing, no miracles, because of he was waiting for somebody to believe him. If I, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced it would have only taken one person to say, oh, you know what, yeah, I can work with him, but I believe. There's just something. I've I, I heard about the miracles. I need to heal it. I, I gotta believe. But then when that one person left the door, he left there. Saddened. Saddened. Then they even did a wonderful miracle that they wanted to speak about. The second thing he was telling Jairus, he says, only believe. In other words, don't look around at your circumstance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People got this will of looking around at what you have instead of what you want will kill that thing that you want, that you're wanting, that you're hoping and praying for. Okay? In Genesis, uh, the 15th verse, uh, God had promised Abraham that he was going to make him a father of many nations. Here's Abraham. He's old. Sarah's old. Okay, she's beyond childbearing years. She's barren. And Jesus, uh, the Lord comes and he promises Abraham that he was going to be a father of many, many nations. And he was going to be the heir of the world. And all these wonderful promises. And so what does he do? Genesis 15 says, Then God brought Abraham outside beneath the nighttime sky and told him, Look up into the heavens and count the stars. If you can, your descendants will be like that. Too many to count. And Abraham believed God. What did God have to do to get Abraham to believe him? He took him out and he showed him the stars. 
Okay? He showed him the stars. He gave him something to look at. So he wasn't looking at his body that was old. He wasn't looking at his wife's body that was old. He wasn't looking at the barren womb. He wasn't looking at the fact that he had no children and he had prayed for children or he had wanted children. He wasn't looking at that. He looked at the stars and he said, hmm. God gave him something to look at. People of God, don't look at your situation. Keep your eyes on where God is leading you. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on the promise. Hallelujah. If you got to put some, take a picture of that thing you need. Put it on your refrigerator and look at that and stop looking. You got an old jalopy? Don't be looking at that jalopy. Thank God for it. Put your picture of that thing that you want on your refrigerator and say, that's what I have. That's what God's going to give me. That's where I'm keeping my eyes on. Hallelujah. God might put something up to remind you that you have a good God who loves you. Praise God. Then do it. You need a man. Get your picture of a good looking man. <laughs> Elijah the prophet. 
and he sends a messenger over to um to to chop off his head. Okay, chopping off people's head ain't good people. <laughs> it's been going on for many, many, many thousands of years. Okay, so he sends a messenger to chop, to chop off um, um, Elijah's head, and so Elijah prophesies to him. Okay, and he tells him in Second Kings seven. Let me see if I can get there so I can read it to y'all. That's all crazy, Lord Jesus. You know where it's at. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the first place. <laughs> 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 I know it was in second place. Okay. Okay, so, that is, so he says, and this is what Elijah says to him. Then Elijah said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a sheet of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two sheets of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on, on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Okay? So um, so here it goes. So what happens after that? Um, Elijah prophesied to the man, there's no food anywhere. They're starving to death. He said, By this time tomorrow, they're going to be selling flour and grain at the gate. Okay? And the man says, What? Even if God will open the windows of heaven, could that happen? I mean, talk about unbelief. Talk about unbelief, okay? And so what happens is that the, 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 the surrounding army, the Syrians, uh, God supernaturally cause, causes them to flee. He makes them hear the sound of chariots. And so they think that all of these armies are coming after them. And they, they for fear, they run off and they leave everything. I mean, they leave everything. And so all of that stuff, then uh, we read the story before, the lepers go in, they find it, and, uh, and Israel is saved. There's a plenty of food, and they're selling it at the gate the next day. Okay, and, 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 and the, the guy, uh, as Elijah prophet, the man that, uh, that said that was not able, he was killed by the mob that crushed him. But anyway, um, again, when you listen, because this man, he could, he, what was he doing? He was looking at the situation. He was looking at what he could see and thought, how can this be? Some people have got, I don't care how impossible your situation is. I don't care how impossible your situation is. Don't look at it. God can do it. God will rescue you. He is able. He is more than able. Do you believe that? Or are you believing that we need to see? People have got to get out of your senses. Get out of your five senses. God doesn't want to live in that realm. If he did, we can touch him, right? Feel him, right? Well, you can feel him, praise God. Thank you. I feel him. I feel his presence. Hallelujah. Okay? Get out of that sense of God. Start believing that there's things in the supernatural that God wants to have. He's got to God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Okay? So let's try to stop figuring out how to figure out how to do things. God will do it for you. He'll figure out how to do it. Hallelujah. And he'll get you, you know, and he has to and he'll speak to you. I want you to go do this to that, that, and you go do it, and guess what? He'll bring it to pass. Okay? Yeah. But it's not up to us to figure out how to do it. Okay? The, the last thing is uh, God told, uh, or Jesus told Jairus, only believe despite what others are believing. Despite what others, people of God, we're going to have some people out there and we're going to be believing for good things. We believe that God has this and that, and you tell them that, and they just kind of laugh at you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, people of God, get away from those naysayers. You don't need people around you to discourage you. Mm -hmm. You need people around you that are going to encourage you, that are going to tell you, yes, you're able to do that. Yes, God will do that. Yes, God is, is ready to help you. Oh, yeah, you know, I'll pray with you. You need those kind of people around you. Hallelujah. Do so you see here, um, um, when Jairus got to the house, it says there was a ton of, there was a large group of people who wept and wailed loudly. Guess what? Those were hired, you know, back in the day, they would hire mourners. Okay? So these people, they were, they were phony. <laughs> they were phony. <laughs> okay? And people got, sometimes there's some people around that are going to be phony. Okay, you okay. mm -hmm. just need to get away from those people. And so what did Jesus do? He put them all out. He, 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 you know, why? Because 
Jesus could not bring that miracle with so much unbelief around him. If you are in a place where there's so much unbelief around you, get out of there, hallelujah. Get out of there and get along with the Lord. Get along with the Lord. Hallelujah. He put all those unbelievers out. He brought the parents because the parents were believing. Jairus was believing. He brought his three disciples because they were believing. Hallelujah. We, it's, you know, it's time to get your Surround yourself with some believers. Surround yourself with people who are believing for you. That are believing with you. Hallelujah. 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 Don't be hanging around with no godly Thomases. <laughs> In John 20, 29, Jesus said to Thomas, remember Thomas didn't believe. He said, unless I put my hand in the, you know, in, in the side where they pierced him and, 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 and touch his hands that, that, uh, where the nails went through, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's about it. We talk about you. You are blessed because you believe on him. Hallelujah. Say, Pastor. I am blessed because I believe in Jesus. Hallelujah. You're not a special blessing that you get in your life because you believe. People, that it's time to believe that you are blessed. You are blessed of the Lord. Hallelujah. You are among you. You, you are among God's uh, uh, protected, a uh, uh, flourishing, loving, beloved children. Hallelujah. He wants you to prosper. Prosperity isn't just for those in Hollywood people. God, it's time. The Bible says that the world of the sinner is laid up for the just. Honey, it's time for you to tell those, tell, tell open the, and her people that it's time for her to give up their money. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and let God get it. So don't you go over there trying to get your money. Okay? <laughs> okay? Praise God. Okay, I'm going to conclude with this. Mark 16. Go ahead and turn it. I want you to see this. It's just a few pages over there. Mark 16, starting in the 16th verse. Let's read this. Don't put down, people. There, it says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly, anything deadly, any poison, they will by no means hurt them, they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Okay, that's powerful. And I used to think that it was automatic. That just because I believe in God, you know, that I'm going to be able to, you know, do this, that, and the other, supernatural things, powerful things. But people of God, it's not. It's not automatic. I'm going to tell you why. Because, or how I know this. I know many Christians who are fearful of demons, let alone yeah. who try to cast one out. Mm -hmm. I know many Christians who don't speak in tongues. They think it's not for them, and the Bible clearly says it's for you. Do not believe that it's for you. And it's power in speaking in tongues. When you start speaking in tongues, you be ready to cast out those demons. Hallelujah, right? I know many Christians who lay hands on low people and make them sick. That's how we got the way around. <laughs> okay? So it's not automatic. It takes believing. It takes believing on God that he's given you the power, okay? Power over super over natural things. He's giving you supernatural power. Supernatural power to, 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 to speak to your money and see it grow. Supernatural power to speak to your body and say, body, you better get in shape. You the only body I have. And I'm telling you right now, starting today, you better start acting right. You know what? I ain't putting up with no asthma anymore. I'm not putting up with no diabetes anymore. I'm not putting up with those migraine headaches. How, how dare you headache come against me? Do you know who I am? Hallelujah. You are anointed. Holy Ghost filled. Yes. Powerful. Hallelujah. Beloved. Faithful. Yes. Believing. Child of the most holy God. How dare sickness come against you? Amen. How dare poverty try to knock at your door? How dare that heart <laughs> that you just that you deserve being a child of God not act right? Amen. People, God, it's time to start 
believe it. Believe that God is able to get that, 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 take, that change your situation. Believe that God is able to change that, that wayward child. Believe that God is able to give you the money that you need to pay your bills. So at the end of the month, when you have one month and you have money, that ain't not to, I'm not to be for a child of God. Amen. Believe. It's time to believe. How many of you are believers? How many believers we got in the house?